Ah. Oh no. Hello there. Uh, we're live from Acquiesce Winery in Acampo, California. I want to welcome everyone to our event. We're so thrilled that you're here joining us today. Uh, this is our second Cook, Drink, and Learn. The first Cook, Drink, and Learn was in November with our Ingenue blend, our Claret Blanche, and our Roussan. Um, and we had Susan and David with us then, and it was such a big hit, everybody has been asking for an encore. So we're doing this right before Valentine's Day. David's come up with some great recipes that would make lovely Valentine dinners. And I just want to tell you a little bit about the setup here. So the setup is not um, like a Zoom call. As you can see, it's a webinar format. But we really would like your interactions on the chat screen. Feel free to chat with each other. And we'll see if we can talk and see what you're chatting about. But if you have a question to ask, we're saying Put it in the ask a question bar at the bottom and after we're through with our little presentation um, we will go to questions at the end of the event and go through the, your questions and hopefully we'll be able to answer all of them so susan and david i met susan manful at a wine writers conference in lodi in 2016 and she happened in our tasting room at that time and was amazed that we were making these Rhone varietals in uh, Lodi. And um, Susan wrote a lovely article about us in her um, gorgeous Provence wine zine blog. Um, and so we've kind of become friends over the years. And um, Susan has introduced us to David along the way, who has been creating wonderful recipes from a lot of the wines that Susan's been featuring. So Susan is a writer. Um, she's an educator. Uh, she has an award-winning uh, online magazine, Provence Wine Zine. She's written a couple booklets also about wine. She's traveled extensively in France and Provence especially. She's pretty much of a rosé expert, talked to many different uh, winemakers and toured the vineyards there. Um, and I'm thrilled that she's joining us again. She's going to be our MC today. So I'm going to turn it over to Susan pretty soon. But I wanted to also mention David Scott Allen. So he's the editor of Cocoa and Lavender, and he can create some beautiful recipes to go with our wines. And as you, if you're trying them right now, I know that uh, you'll be able to confirm that. Um, we have here set up, we've got them all made here and I'm gonna be tasting them with the wines when it's time. So without further ado, Susan, if you'd like to take over, uh, feel free. Okay. All right, well, thank you, Sue, very much for that introduction. Thank you very much for having us. And I'm so glad that David is here as well. As Sue indicated, I, I met her in Lodi one August a few years ago. And she mentioned that I was very surprised that she was growing so many Rhone varietal uh, grapes. But what I was really surprised about was how fabulous the wines are. So we did have, we've developed uh, what I'd like to think is a very nice relationship, beginning with wine and food. Like David, my relationship began over wine and food at a lunch one day here in uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And I think, uh, I'd like to think that some of the best relationships are born over a glass of wine and some very, some nice food. Um, that's uh, a great way to get started. So I um, would also like to thank, just a shout out now for uh, Carolyn, Kauser Abbott at Perfectly Provence for helping to promote our uh, webinar today. And Caroline, I think, Caroline, I think that you are are here. Um, welcome, welcome to everyone. I see a lot of familiar names. I see Mr. Norcross, I see Michael and Paula, and I see uh, my cousin Julie and her dad, Max, and their friends. Uh, Elman and Mylene, and I welcome you. Um, I'm especially glad that they're here 
because they, uh, my uncle and my, my aunt and my cousins, spent a good deal of their lives in Spain. And um, Spain is the likely, very likely home of uh, Grenache, which is of course what we're talking about today. Um, so I, oh, and I also wanna thank Rodney for all of his technical work and uh, the same for Mark and David's house and Townie in, in my house. Without them helping us, I, I think that uh, it wouldn't go as well as it does. So anyway, let's talk about the wines. Um, we're going to begin with the Grenache Blanc and that we will follow that with the Grenache Blanc Sparkling. This is a still wine and we'll follow that with a, a, a sparkling and then we'll go on to the Rosé. Please open your wine now so that you can start tasting it. And I, um, I'm gonna open our Grenache Blanc. This is the corkscrew that I like to use. This is the corkscrew that I was taught to open wine with. And it was my grandfather who taught me how to open wine. He taught me, he taught me about Broadway shows and how to open wine in addition to how to live a very good life. He was an importer of wine supplies, including cork. Um, so anyway, this is the corkscrew that he taught me to use. It's called a waiter's or sommelier's corkscrew. And you just simply insert it, hold the bottle, and... Susan, you might want to lift it up a little bit because we can't see a lot of the... Oh, the oh, 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 there you go. Yeah. Okay, can you hold this? Yes. Okay, so you get it in here, and then if you have a good corkscrew, like mine from Acquiesce Winery, <laughs> you have a lever here, which allows you to pull it up a little bit, and then you can pull it up the rest of the way. And voila! Ta -da. A nice sound. So, Tony, would you pour that in? and we'll get started. So do start by opening your wines. Um, you don't need to open all of your wines, uh, but if you have enough people there, I encourage you to do so. There are lots of ways to keep your, whatever wine might be left over. I mean, in, in our house, unless we're opening up a whole lot, there isn't a lot of wine left over, but there are ways to do that. And I will, I think I'll hold off and show you what you can do uh, towards the end with your leftover wine, um, because of course you wouldn't want it to go to waste. <laughs> so um, get your wine out. And I was just asked the question the other day of how you hold white wine or any kind of wine that's chilled. It's best to hold it by the stem, but it's your glass, so you can really hold it however you want to. But the reason to hold it by the stem is so that the wine stays at a cool temperature. So um, that's just a heads up on that. And I also want to mention how far do you fill up a wine glass? This is just about right because this will allow me to move the wine around so that we can smell it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, don't pour your wine all the way up to here. It's not appealing. It's really, really not appealing. And it's, uh, you can't smell your wine that way, as you'll see in just a few minutes. So uh, with those sort of details, I think, out of the way, let's get into what we'll be tasting. It's Grenache. Very simple, Grenache. But there's three main varieties of Grenache. There's Grenache Blanc, which we have I have in my hand right now. There is Grenache Noir, from which the rosé is made. That's the red grape. Grenache Noir it actually literally translates into black Grenache. There's also a Grenache Gris. There's very little of that in the world. And uh, I read so may, I've read so many times now that it's very rare to find a 100% Grenache Gris. Then I put Tony on the job to see if he could find one. And lo and behold, we've located a couple of them. And we'll go down and get them tomorrow in, in Boston if there isn't too much snow here. So those are the three main colors, if you will, or varieties. There's the Grenache Noir, Grenache Blanc, 
and the uh, Grenache Gris, meaning gray. But should you want to impress your friends about another Grenache, there is one in English, it would be the hairy Grenache. But if you want to sound a little bit more sophisticated, you would call it a Garnacha Peluda, which means in Spanish, a hairy or furry uh, Grenache. Um, I should point out now, Grenache is French, Garnacha is Spanish. And I'll get back to that subject in just a minute. The grapes aren't hairy, but it's the leaves underneath there that are hairy. And I don't think that, I didn't fully investigate it, but I don't, I'm pretty sure there aren't any 100% Garnacha Paluda wines, but, but we'll, we'll get on that for you. Um, there, uh, it's, it's likely, very likely that the wine, uh, was um, first prop with uh, the, um, the origin of the wine began in Spain, in northern Spain. There are some people who have put forth the idea that it began in Sardinia, um, but the evidence certainly is not as strong for that as it is for, for Spain. Um, it has a long history. There's some evidence that Grenache Noir. Uh, that the seeds and the leaves of Grenache uh, Noir uh, have been found in um, Spain that go back to 100, 100, 153 BC. So, um, you know, who knew? I, I didn't know that. Um, so it's been around for, for a long time. Uh, the vast majority of it does grow in France now. Uh, Spain would be second. But there is a fair amount that's, well, there's some that's grown in California, and there's been a real renewed interest in it in California. It actually was, for, there's a lot of people from California, so I'll say that it was introduced to California in the 19th century, mid 19th century, and most of it was grown in the San Joaquin Valley. If you know California, Fresno, for those of you who know me, really hot, um, but it was, uh, very popular there. They made a lot of bulk wine and a lot of uh, rosé. Uh, that's not what we're doing with Grenache Noir for the most part. That's definitely not what Sue is doing. <laughs> and um, it's gone down from 20,000 acres at that time to, uh, what is it now? In California, the total Grenache is about uh 329 acres so really not not too much in lodi there's uh combining the blanc and the noir there's about 100 acres and i hope you remember where lodi is it's at the very top of the central valley in california and it is almost directly east of the san francisco bay so I'll get Sue to elaborate on this, but the days can be hot in the summer, but there is a very nice, cool breeze that comes from um, from the bay into into um, into Lodi. So the the um, the terroir is very nice for growing uh, Grenache, Noir, and uh, and Blanc. What else do I want to say before I turn you over to David? David, the, the way we're going to do this is that David, as I think you all understand, is going to demonstrate how to make one of the recipes that we send to you. And this is the one that goes with the Grenache Blanc. Um, it is an exquisite pairing. I mean, pairings, you know, they can be really good, really enjoyable, but this particular pairing that um, we will begin with is super good. And then you have two other recipes, which he will not demonstrate today, but you can make those. I saw that Mary Norcross has her angel food cake cooling right now. So, um, and I think that my cousin Julie was going to make the angel food cake. You might wonder if you did make the angel food cake, what in the world you're going to do with uh, 12 yolks? Because it required 12 whites. And David will talk about that a little bit. Um, he is going to begin with the... Uh, Foyete, I'm going to get him to pronounce that a little bit better. The Foyete au champignon sauvage. And I think without further ado, David. And, and David, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. 
All right, so you're on. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. I am having problem with audio, so that's why Susan asked if she could hear me. Um, I've heard that you can hear me fine, but if there are questions and I miss them, I will be uh, getting off of this device and getting onto one where I can hear you better for later for more questions. So thank you all for being here today. It's a lot of fun to have you here. And I especially want to say a shout out to my family from the East Coast and my friends uh, from New Jersey and upstate New York who are joining us today. Um, I am starting with the Feuilleté de Champignons Sauvage. Uh, I use wild mushrooms. I got a couple questions from um, through email about what mushrooms I use. And my mushroom choice is what's usually available. So it could be as simple as cremony mushrooms, which are readily available everywhere, uh, to sometimes I put in a couple of shiitakes. But today, I will be using um, a king trumpet. And um, I don't know what you can see, what you can't, but I have a king trumpet. I have a whole pile of piapini mushrooms, which are tiny little mushrooms that I used last time. And I have, again, a lion's mane mushroom. And it's a beautiful mushroom uh, that I get from our farmer's market. To start with, though, we have to get the, the boxes, the pastry boxes, which we call foyete. And foyete is um, a, it's a puff pastry box, basically. It's a vehicle to, to put the mushrooms in. So I have done one of my two uh, box preps here, as you can see, and I am going to make the other one. So my dough that I use is from Trader Joe's. It's 100% butter puff pastry, and um, I, it does not come square. So my squares will be oblongs. I'm going to cut it in half uh, using a ruler to measure, make sure I get them equal because they are going to stack. And I'm using a very sharp knife and I am pulling it across rather than pushing down. By pushing down, you end up uh, compressing the dough and you don't want to compress the layers. So I will put my first layer on my parchment line sheet. And then with the second layer, I'm gonna take that same very sharp knife and about a half an inch from the edge. And it doesn't have to be exact because these are gonna puff and look so different when they go doesn't really matter. I'm going to go around the edges inside and cut out what we call the lid. And if they're uneven, it doesn't matter. It's all going to be fine. It's going to look beautiful no matter what. You want to make sure you get your edges cut so that when you pull out the center, it doesn't tear the dough. Again, compressing the layers and making them, making it difficult for them to puff. So now I have my, whoops, I missed one there. I have my little window, my box around the edges, and I have my top. And then I'm going to brush the pastry with water. The water just simply becomes a glue of sorts so that the pastries stick to each other. You don't have to use anything like egg white. You could use egg white. That would be fine, too. Uh, water is a great option. And we're going to put the outside part on first, and we're going to mash up the edges, if you can see that. And... We're going to press it down lightly, and then we're going to take the middle part and do exactly the same thing. We're going to press it down in the middle and get it into the center. And I think I got it upside down, but that's going to be fine. And then we're going to brush this with egg yolk. And egg yolks um, are the, the part of the egg that's going to go bad the quickest. Egg whites will last forever. So when we use an egg white, an egg yolk, we want to make sure that we uh, save the white. And so I save the whites in a little jar. You can see I have probably about three quarters of a cup of egg whites in here. So that's probably five egg whites. And I keep this in my refrigerator at all times so that I have a collection of egg whites when I feel like an egg white omelet or making a cake. Um, so then we're going to take the egg yolk and we are going to brush very carefully the tops only of the pastry um, and I'm going to put my glasses on for this so I don't mess it up. Uh, we don't want the, the yolk to get it all on the sides of the pastry. Again, that will stop it from puffing. It will become glue and you won't get a good puff. Um, I am using, these are, this is Trader Joe's puff pastry, which is for them a seasonal product, which drives me crazy because I think any season is puff pastry season. Don't you all agree? Yes. Um, but um, 
there is a brand called Dufour, D-U-F-O-U-R, of the oven. And that is readily available in some stores. So it's not really readily available, but it's also very expensive. It tends to be around $12, $13 per box. Uh, Pepperidge Farm uh, is out there. I know that one of our uh, reader, or our uh, attendees is using Pepperidge Farm today. Um, the nice thing about Pepperidge Farm, and I know we we're going to discuss this later, Susan, so my apologies, um, is that you can use it for your vegan friends because there is no dairy at all in Pepperidge Farm plus pastry. It's all made with oils. So you can be feel free to... Uh, serve that to your vegan friends, and they'll all be very happy that they're not having butter. Me, though, I want the butter. And so I'm going to finish decorating my little top here. And this will give the tops a really beautiful golden brown. All right. So I'm going to stick these in the oven, and they're going to go in for 12 minutes. And the oven just happens to be right in front of me. And I'm going to put the timer on. The other thing, you're going to have leftover yolk here. Um, so the thing that I didn't mention in the recipe, because I probably used the yolk for something else last time, you can mix that yolk with the cream you're going to be using later to make the sauce, and it'll make it a little bit more velvety. So that's one other thing you can do with the yolk. Um, okay, so that is in the oven. Now it's going to be time for our shallots and mushrooms. Um, I'm going to put my pan on uh, fairly high. I'm going to be sauteing the mushrooms. Uh, a question I get a lot when I teach cooking classes is, well, what actually does saute mean in terms of heat? So saute is the French word saute for jump. So that means you want a fairly good heat on it. Um, and you don't want it to be, you know, simmering in whatever, whatever uh, fat you're using, butter or olive oil. And then you, I'm just going to peel my shallots here and get them chopped. Uh, you want it at a pretty good high heat so that when they gets in there, it sizzles a little bit. And the thing about uh, shallots is that they will eventually start turning brown if they're sauteed too long. So you want to do a brief saute on them. And my shallot today was about an ounce and a half. I think I called for two ounces of shallots, but I'm just going to use the one. Um, and that should be good. So I've got my heat going. I'm going to put some butter in the pan, and then we're going to get going on this fun project. <coughs> All right. Butter. Where's the butter? There's the butter. All right, it's about three tablespoons of butter. It's going to melt in there. We're going to put the shallots in and get to the mushrooms. So the thing about the mushrooms, when you have these mushrooms like the piapini and the really small ones, they can go in whole and, and they'll be fine. They may be a little bit long, but they'll, they'll cook down a little bit. With something like the king trumpet, I'm going to cut off the head of it and cut the stem in two. So I have three pieces, and then I'm going to cut them in what I would consider bite-sized pieces. Mushrooms will shrink as they cook, so you don't have to be too tiny, but you don't want it to be too big because it will be ungainly for someone to try and eat. Now, for garnish, in the photograph I sent, I used a piapini mushroom. You could take one slice of your king trumpet and make sure that one gets beautifully browned and sauteed. And then you can use that as your garnish. Or you can just save one of the piapinis. Again, the, the lion's mane, some of them are large and need to be broken down. And I just do a half and then cut them into pieces. And lion's mane mushrooms are a very nutty mushroom, if you can get them. Um, they, I've often seen them at Whole Foods. Uh, I don't see them much other around than at the farmer's market. So my, my mushrooms are now all chopped. That's six ounces of mushrooms. Um, yes, I did weigh them. I do have a scale, and I think everybody should have a kitchen scale. Um, so um, use your kitchen scale. It doesn't have to be exact. This recipe was a gift to me from my friends Pauline and Alex. It's Alex's mom's recipe. They may actually have joined us, and they may be with us. They live in Zurich, Switzerland. It's a little late in the evening there. Uh, but it's Alex's mom's recipe, which was originally a roulade, which I thought, well, just for two of us, the roulade isn't going to be very good. So I decided to make it into these poyete, these puff pastry boxes, which worked out beautifully. Um, Alex's mom would go out and just go into the fields and pick wild mushrooms. Uh, not many of us have that option or the, uh, mm -hmm. leg, uh, the uh, education to know 
which ones are the safe mushrooms and which ones are not. Now, often when I cook one shallot in butter, I don't use three tablespoons. The reason we do that, when you add the mushrooms in, they will start absorbing all that butter quite nicely. And we're gonna let them sit for just a few minutes um, to begin to brown. That is a trick Julia Child taught me in one of her books. It's probably making Beurre Bourguignon. David? Mushrooms brown the best when they're sitting still. Do is there David? Question? Yes, yeah. uh, we've had a request if you could just slow down a little. I, I know our time is limited, but if you could just slow the down pace. a little the pace. Some sure. people are having a problem keeping up. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Um, the mushrooms are now sauteing. It's going to take a little while for them to brown. And while they're beginning to cook, I'm going to add some chopped tarragon. I have about a tablespoon of fresh chopped tarragon. One question I got prior to the show was whether to use fresh or dry tarragon. Um, you can use either. Uh, tarragon is actually one of the few dried herbs that really tastes like itself when it's dried. And just a recommendation that when you use a dried herb instead of a fresh herb, use about a third of the amount to a half of the amount, depending, um, that it's called for, because dried is much more um, concentrated. So you, you, won't, you don't want too strong a flavor. So I have about a tablespoon of the tarragon. David. My mushrooms are starting to brown. David, David. I'm gonna have to come around with the sautéing. I can't quite hear you. I'll be, I'll be okay. Off. No, no, no. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> okay. I, what, what, what was the question? Well, I was just going to ask you why you chose tarragon. Ah, okay. Out of all the possible herbs that you could have chosen. So I chose tarragon because I think it's a really flavorful mushroom or <laughs> herb. It's a very flavorful herb. It's also one that goes very well with mushrooms, and it goes well with uh, several other things, really. It goes very well with chicken. I love it with lobster. Um, it doesn't go well with everything, and oddly, it is not a very popular herb. There are many people who dislike tarragon. So um, I chose it because I thought it would be a great flavor for this particular dish with the cream, and uh, it goes really, really well with the wine. I think um, Sue uh, Tipton could talk to that, but tarragon and, and actually basil too with this wine is really, really good. Mm -hmm. So Sue, um, I thought that the tarragon, well, I thought the entire meal was, was really terrific. Um, are there any other herbs that could be used when we're pairing it with Grenache Blanc? Well, I find that um, Pretty much any herbs go really well with my wines, but uh, thyme in particular is really lovely. You could do parsley, um, rosemary works really nice also. So um, tarragon, I agree, is a traditional French um, herb to be used in a dish like this. I think it's just spot on, and um, I think it worked out just lovely. Me too. Terrific. Terrific match. So my mushrooms are getting golden. I am going to pick one mushroom to be the garnish. So I'm looking through to find one really nice one that's going to look very pretty. I think I'm going to go with a piapini again because it looks just perfect. I'm going to hold that aside. I'm not burn myself, I promise. Um, and now I'm going to deglaze the pan. Oh, uh, back to saute. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to deglaze the pan. The reason we deglaze the pan is that it takes the bits and pieces that get stuck to the pan and helps make them part of the sauce. It also really adds a nice touch of wine flavor to the, um, the dish. All right, so putting in the wine, sizzling. And we're going to cook this down about by half. That's a really um, vague thing to tell someone. You can't really measure what's a half 
but what you're looking for is that there's less liquid, it's gotten a little thicker, and you have a really nice um, base for your sauce. So um, someone also asked why I chose this wine. I chose a dry white wine. Um, you don't want a sweet wine because then it could affect more of the taste of the wine you're having. So Mike's now reduced quite nicely, and I'm going to add the cognac, which is, I, I said two tablespoons. It's actually an ounce or the small end of your jigger. And then so those of you that are cooking along, is everyone's kitchen smelling just amazing right now? You're talking to me. I can't hear at the moment. That's okay. So I'm going to put in the cream. And we're going to go a little further because this is going to come off the heat in just a minute. And then I can hear you. I, I'm sure that those of you who watch the news um, on cable TV are, are used to some technical difficulties that... Um, that we're, we're dealing with right now that in spite of our our test runs um we we have uh we have a little glitch here but i think you're probably used to this kind of thing happening these days so we'll just go with the flow and enjoy our wine okay, um, okay. now i can hear again uh, my mushrooms are cooked they are very clear. Uh, they, 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 you can see the sauce is quite nice. It's going to thicken a bit as it cools a little bit. Um, I just got mushroom on the stove. Um, and uh, now it's almost time for the foyete to come out of the oven. What I have found in uh, doing this is that sometimes the when they come out of the oven, the center part, the cap, the cover has not risen as much as the rest of the foyete, so it sinks in the middle. So what I do is I very carefully use that same knife, I cut out the centers, put them back on the parchment, and put them back in the oven for three or four minutes until they've puffed up completely, because you want both sides to be puffed. All right. Um, any questions at the moment? David, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about the the wine if we have a just a minute break. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what I, I didn't talk about is actually enjoying the aromas from this wine. They are really amazing. Uh, so what I encourage you, as some of you are actually indicating, what I'd like you to do is to, this is Sue's suggestion, put your hand on top of your glass, swirl it around, so that we're uh, adding oxygen to bring the the um, flavors out in this wine, which are really wonderful. And then you really need to stick your nose in. Um, and I'd love for you to write in the chat box what it is that you're you're noticing. I encourage you again to stick your nose all the way in. And something I learned just this week is that. Each nostril operates independently. In a normal nose, one nostril will be more dominant than the other at any given time. I didn't know that. No. And it cycles back and forth every two to five hours. So it's a good idea to stick one nostril really in there and see what you smell, and then stick the other one in and see what you smell. And it looks like we're ready to hear from the cook. So I'd love to hear yeah. what you're tasting. So what you can see, the boxes are nice. Yes. But the centers didn't rise as I had said they wouldn't. And I don't want to burn my hand any further. And so I'm going to cut out the centers very carefully. It doesn't, it, they, they should be almost detached because of the way we made them. And then I'm going to use a small spatula, which is, of course, not there it is. These small spatulas are one of my favorite uh, tools in the kitchen. And we're going to use that to pop out the center. Pineapple. And put it back onto the, po uh, onto the um, parchment. I get that. I get that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I get that. Uh, golden delicious apple, melon, creamy mouthfeel, absolutely. Patty, right on. 
How about uh, citrus on the nose, particularly lime? I get that too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you try both nostrils, everyone? <laughs> and then a couple hours later, try the other one. Like lemon grass. Lemon right, have gone back in the oven. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm going to finish this up quickly because it's almost time to serve. I added, put the mushrooms back on the heat. I added the final tablespoon of butter. I'm adding some parsley from the front garden, and I'm going to season it with salt and pepper. And terrific. It is going to be just perfect. So we're going to season and so i say somebody else is getting lemongrass uh, what about minerality all right anybody too that's pear. a characteristic of many of your wines uh pear also mm -hmm. And uh, Suzanne from uh, Lodi is saying uh, jasmine or honeysuckle, which she hasn't uh, experienced before. Uh, Suzanne, in this wine, you haven't experienced before? David, there is a question for you from Patty. Is the cream going to thicken? The cream will thicken, especially as you continue to cook it or if it cools. Um, so it's right now just about at the right consistency if you make this a little in advance and it's too thick there's nothing wrong ever with adding more cream ah. <laughs> you know, tap more salt, and then it is ready to serve so the um tops are coming out of the oven in probably another minute or so they're just puffing up a little bit in there to make them a little bit more puffy and i'm going to clean this area here so i can play here all right, and while David is doing that, I just want to tell you, I just many of you already know this, but so much of tasting wine has to do with the smelling, uh, the aroma of wine. And that information actually goes into your brain, into the occipital lobe, um, in, uh, in actually, oh, a factory bulb, sorry. Uh, actually, in, through two different pathways, one through the back of your mouth and one through your nose. We have 400 receptors in the uh, olfactory bulb that helps us determine what the wine may smell like and actually taste like. Yeah, Lynn is saying the wine is changing as it opens up. Ah, really yeah. good observation. Yeah. That's what makes wine so fun, I think. You know, and it's a living, breathing organism, which you know, that's why it's always changing, evolving, and it makes every glass different than the last glass and a lot of fun. Okay, David. <laughs> May I interrupt for a second? Okay, so we're ready to serve. Um, I, I took the tops out of the oven. They are nicely puffed. You will notice that the bottom inside of your box doesn't look like it's cooked. It's perfectly fine. Just take some of the mushrooms, spoon them into the center. And then we top with one of the box tops, and there is the dish. Oh, beautiful. Wow. So Bravo. Now, I am going to sign off on this phone and uh, sign back on on my iPad so I can hear you all and talk a little bit better. But enjoy if you've made this, and then we'll talk more about the other recipes. Okay. All right. So, so let me ask you about the, the wine. Let me take this opportunity. Um, why is there so little Grenache Blanc grown in the United States? Any ideas on that? I think, you know, the, that it's a puzzle. And um, I don't know if you remember Jean Bonnet from the San Francisco Chronicle for years was always preaching, why not more Grenache Blanc? A lot of it has to do with the American way of purchasing wine. Um, they only know, most Americans only know a few different varietals. They know Cabernet, Chardonnay, Merlot, now Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Grigio, but to have a varietal that they're unaware of is something they're not going to buy off a store shelf. So it's only the small little boutique wineries like ours that are producing these wines because you can walk in and taste the wine and then decide if you like it or not. And so since most Americans don't know what Grenache Blanc is, I mean, I remember seeing it in 
tasting room. Um, people saying, oh, I've never heard of it, trying it, and they had the same reaction I did when I first tried uh, my uh, Chateauneuf de Pop White. It's like, where has this wine been my whole life, and why <laughs> haven't I had more of it? <laughs> so. <laughs> wow. So you planted your first half acre uh, each of Grenache Blanc and Grenache Noir. When was that? Uh, in 2008, we planted a half acre of the Grenache Blanc and a half acre of the uh, Grenache Noir. And our first harvest was in 2010. And we opened the tasting room in 2012. So this is actually our going into our 10th year with the tasting room open, making professional wow. wines. So. Wow. So um, I'm going to just squeeze one more quick question in until we get David back. Um, what gave you the confidence to plant the Grenache Blanc when hardly anybody else was growing it and certainly not much in uh, Lodi? Yeah, so um, that's why we started with a half acre, pretty much. It was an experimentation <laughs> process, and we were so thrilled with it, uh, we thought we have to plant more of it. So this is basically, it's really fun doing this event with, featuring Grenache Blanc because it is our signature varietal. It's the first one we planted. We have more of that than any of the other whites at three acres. <coughs> And then we also are using it for, you know, our um, sparkling wine. So, yeah. yeah. It's really super. And we're, we're getting all sorts of fabulous comments. I hope you're, you're looking at a, a few of them. I love this wine. Lovely. Um, really wonderful. And we're getting lots of compliments with regard to David's dish. David, are you there? No. David? No, he's not there right now. We're trying to get him back on since he's changed. All it. right. So let's um, let's see the two of them together. Those of you who have the dish, please try them together because I think there's real synergy here. I don't. I've already made the dish and we enjoyed it, and I thought it was an unbelievable pairing. Sue, what are your thoughts? It's outstanding. You know, and the earthiness of the mushrooms the delicacy of the cream and Grenache Blanc loves anything creamy. If it's a, a cream sauce or it's mayonnaise or anything like that, Grenache Blanc goes really well with it. So even though Grenache Blanc has a pretty big mid palate, it has a great acidity to it. So it's a nice complement to this dish. I think it's a match made in heaven. And I really think David did a great job uh, coming up with this um, recipe. It's a lot of fun, and I think if you haven't made it yet, it would be the perfect Valentine's dinner, for sure. Post this today. Excellent. So, um, to the chef. Our cheers to the chef. Cheers. Yes, thanks, David. And David, we've got a question from uh, Connie. She said that her mushroom mixture has lots of liquid. Please help. Okay, so when you cook down the mushrooms, um, it's it's good to let them saute until the mushroom liquid has evaporated before you put in the wine. But if you've already done that, you can still let it cook down and then put the cream in and it will thicken. Did that help, Connie? So we were just saying to cook it a little longer? Yeah, the, but, but mushrooms release a lot of liquid when they cook. Um, so uh, it depends on the mushroom you've got and what kind of liquid content there is. And so when that comes out, you want to just cook it so that the liquid evaporates before then going on to deglaze. But mm -hmm. it doesn't kill it if you haven't done that. So almost for anything that could go wrong. Okay, great. Almost anything that could okay. go wrong in cooking can be fixed. There are a couple things that can't, but this is one that's easily oh, okay. fixed. Uh, it, it's a terrific dish. And then as uh, Catherine said, it's a very elegant dish. So. If you have not made it or are not making it now, I really encourage you guys to to do so. And it's a terrific it's a terrific match. I think we probably I'm trying it. What's that? What what do you think? What do you think, David? First bite. <laughs> mm, it's perfect with this one. It really is. Oh, so lovely. 
uh, at the risk of um, uh, moving along when you're still eating, David, I think in light of time, I mean, because we really could talk all afternoon about, about Grenache and tasting the wines and what have you. I think maybe we ought to move into the, the sparkling Grenache. And um, for fun, you guys could see what the spark. If you if you've made this meal, you can see what the sparkling grenache tastes like uh, with this particular with this particular dish. Um, David paired the dish with uh, a souffle, either individual souffles or a large souffle, which really again is an excellent pairing. Is uh, we've made those two, and so here is the grenache blanc, the sparkling wine. And I'm going to have Tony open that. I and get to open it? Yes, you get to open it. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I could a, um... Can I say a, a minute about the about the souffles? That it's um, this is Jacques Pépin's mother's souffle recipe, and it is a, a really spectacular recipe. And it's very easy and it's very forgiving. And the the cheeses you use can be changed, and that can help you choose your wine pairing as well. Good point. And David, you were talking to me about how it, the cheese may taste quite differently with a given wine once you've cooked it. Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll use blue cheeses as a really great example. Oftentimes, blue cheeses are much harder to pair with wines than non-blue cheeses. But when you cook with blue cheeses, there's something chemically that happens that really um, changes their flavor and their pairability. Their pairability. Okay. All right. Well, so here, uh, this is a safe way to open up a sparkling bottle. There you go. Oh. <laughs> Another night sound. I'm going to go open okay. mine. I'll be right back with it. Okay. Okay. So here we go. So Susan said that was so easy. About to try the souffle with the sparkling. So I also made the souffle. And so I've got a little piece of it here to try with the sparkling. And the souffle was super easy to make, just super That's easy. Really? In fact, it was so easy, I thought we must have been doing something wrong. It was so <laughs> incredibly easy and delicious. And I see that there's another Susan who's talking about how, how easy it was to make. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's going to she's about to try it with the sparkling wine. Let me um, well Sue try it and then I want to talk a teeny bit about the sparkling wine. How does it go? Really nice pairing. And you know the souffle has got a lot of cheese and eggs in it, so it's pretty hearty and the sparkling just lifts the meal, I think. So the souffle is excellent. But the sparkling complements it nicely, I think, with the minerality and the nice acid burst to it uh, goes really well. And the souffle, too, we tried it a week ago. It does really well if you put it in the refrigerator and pop it in the microwave the next day for mm -hmm. lunch. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to say that with the souffle, I just remind you that, as David said in his recipe, you could make the... the um, small version and if you made the small version and ramekins for example um i think that that's a really it's a nice uh, uh appetizer something to begin your meal with and then move over to the foyette so we didn't do it in that order um, now but that's something that, that you can think about um, i want to raise our glasses to sue on uh, this wine although we could do it with all of them but this wine just won a gold medal in the San Francisco International Wine um, Competition. She has quite a few gold medals mm -hmm. under her belt. Actually, the Grenache Blanc that we just had, that won a silver medal at the same competition. Um, this is These grapes were picked in 2018 and um, spent some time turning into champagne, shall we say. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're just released over this past summer. Uh, so do you want to say just a few words about how you did this? Just very few. Because this yes. is a very special sparkling wine. We can't call it champagne because it's not from champagne. But it is made like a champagne would be made. Right. So it's a real special process. We pick these grapes earlier than we pick 
the Grenache Blanc grapes for our still wine. So they're picked earlier so they have a really nice acidic bite to them. After the wine is completely finished, they're put into, the wine is put into individual bottles. A little sugar and yeast capsule is added to it. Uh, it's capped off like with a beer cap. And then it's riddled where it's mixed up. So you're mixing the sugar and the yeast and the wine together. And then it rests for a, quite a long time. So minimum one year it will rest. And then um, in this case, it was about 14 months. And then um, we do a dosage trial. So we go and we take off the beer caps and fry the wine to see if it needs any. And um, this wine was pretty complete in the bottle. So we added just a little bit of a dosage, but uh, we wanted to keep it a nice dry wine. And then at that point, it's um, capped with your traditional champagne cap. And so we released it in July and uh, we haven't been open since March, but uh, we've already sold 60 cases of it. So I think that it's um, showing quite well. It's, it's really spectacular. How many cases did you make this year? So there were 300 uh, cases of wine. So we hope that they'll last for another, I want to get the exact, but uh, 335 cases. And so we're hoping they'll last a little bit because it's a over two year process to make it. And so we didn't make any uh, in 2020. So we're hoping it lasts us a couple years. So, well, it's just terrific, and I want to tell everybody who is listening that this is, in all likelihood, the only sparkling Grenache Blanc in the country. In fact, I think we're pretty sure about that, and it may be the only one in the world. When I um, put some information out about this on my Instagram, a couple of French wine writers said, sparkling Grenache Blanc, wow. So you're really drinking something very special. Yeah, we actually had a, a winery owner from Spain here about a year ago. And him and his family had been growing Grenache Blanc for generations, and they had never heard of a sparkling Grenache Blanc, and they were really happy to try it. So it, it's a lot of fun. It really is. It's, it's, it's super good. Um, we're getting, uh, someone has said that they're getting honey on the nose. I get that. Again, a lot of minerality in, in my mind. Anything else that, that, that I think brioche is what I get on it, like a, a brioche bread. Yeah. And yeah. that's because of the yeast that's the added. Yeast. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I get the yeast as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I also get um, a decent amount of citrus in it. Um, yeah. and I did just cheat and I tried it with the feuilleté. And it is actually wonderful with the Fuete as well. So. Ah, interesting. <laughs> okay, good to know. Just All right, that's... That out there. And I noticed that Renee, um, Renee Metzger asked a question about egg whites. Um, I'm assuming, Renee, you're talking about the souffle. And you could make the souffle all with egg whites, but it will be a, mm, a drier souffle. It'll be much more, um, it'll be less rich. It'll be spongier. But you could definitely try it. And I've never made it with, I've never made anything with carton egg whites. So if anybody here has had luck with egg whites from a carton, please put that in the chat for Renee because I only have used fresh. So, um, so before we move on, and I know we need to move on, but I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about cheeses that might go with sparkling wine because I think sometimes people don't really think about matching cheese with sparkling wine. Yeah, so one of my favorite cheeses with sparkling wine is a triple creme from France. Um, I think that the richer the cheese, the nicer it goes with the sparkling. Um, but the sparkling wine is very much, oh, look at that. Is that a triple crown right there? Yes, there yeah. we go. <laughs> a camembert. <laughs> or... <laughs> and, uh, we have a goat cheese, and then did you get a, is that a Gruyere or a, a Comté? Gruyere. Gruyere. And then Chevre. Ah, so, how are those who work? Yes, yes. And, Really, sparkling is very much like rosé and it goes with anything, really. There's very few things that a sparkling or a rosé will not pair with. Um, I don't really know of anything, actually. <laughs> Great. And by itself, too, is fine. 
Yes, <laughs> the by itself is very nice. <laughs> so, um, and Suzanne, that actually is a Daphinois that uh, that we have there. That was our daughter's very favorite cheese, and so we always get that and think of Alex. Um, all right, so let's move on to the next wine, if uh, if you'd like to. That's that's the rosé. Okay. So I'm going to just uh, here we go right here. and go go ahead. I think and just open it. I was I was going to demonstrate the the Corvin, um, but I think we'll skip that for now. We'll do that on another on another class because maybe we'll we'll drink more. Um, so this particular rosé is a double gold medal winner at the International Women's Wine Competition. And it is a gold medal winner at the same competition in San Francisco that I mentioned. Plus, so it is win best rosé in the American uh, Wine Society competition also. It won what, say that again? Best rosé in the American Wine Society 2020 competition, which was- Oh, wow, so okay. I don't have it in my notes, but. Oh, that's great to know. And well, and I can add, and, and Michael and Paula, uh, who are here, and Mary Norcross know this, that um, I took a bottle of this last, I guess maybe the year before. This is a 2019 vintage. I probably took the 2017 vintage to France with me for our, um, on our tours. And we mixed it in with a few French rosé or Provence rosés and uh, Southern Rhone rosés. This one came out number one. Remember that, Michael and Mary? Uh, anyway, let, let's, this is a rosé. Let's take a look at the color. And a good way of looking at the color of any wine, but particularly of rosés, is, oh, sorry, to look at it against something white. If you have a white tablecloth or a piece of a white plate, piece of paper that allows you to see the color. Because part of the fun of a rosé really is the color. Um, now, those of you who drink a lot of rosé may know that um, this is a darker rosé than, than uh, the Provence rosés, for example. So I often get the question, and I'm just going to give you the three questions that I often get because I have such a sophisticated audience here. I'm sure you're not going to ask them, but it just um, in case you know somebody who's who's asked you before, does a darker color mean it's sweet? No, 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 no. The the, the color of the rosé is due to many different factors. Uh, for example, the um, the grapes that are used, the length of time that the juice and the grape skins are together. Um, many things, but it is not going to tell you what the sweetness is. In, in fact, Sue, mm -hmm. how much sugar is in this wine? It's technically, there's 0% sugar. So it is a dry wine, even though you have this fruit forwardness. And that's uh, something else that's kind of a difficult discussion sometimes in the tasting room. Somebody will say, I want your driest wine, and we'll say that they're all dry, but yet rosé and then viognier also, they have these great fruit aromas that per you perceive as being sweet. And so that's kind of a difficult discussion when people don't really understand dry for a winemaker means the percentage of sugar that's in the wine when you have it tested. So this is zero, although you get a nice sweetness from the fruit. So even though there's no sugar in it. I think the Grenache Blanc was also a zero. Is yeah, that right? All, all our wines are 0%. And that's a winemaker choice, obviously. But um, that <laughs> I prefer that, I think that drier wines go better with food. And since we're all about cooking and drinking and learning, <laughs> why not all dry wines? So. Yeah. Um, so also just again, Rosé, um, I can't, imagine anybody would actually ask this question here but a question i actually get a lot of the time rosé is not a gray no. okay, just, just to be clear <laughs> this is made from 100 percent grenache noir is there a cake we can see all right and um then also sometimes people ask if rosé is made by combining red and white wine just let's just get rid of that 
uh, theory, no, it is it is not. In fact, it is not legal in uh, France to make rosé. Um, and it's not legal in most countries. I think that there are a few to make um, rosé out of red and white. With making champagne, you can mix, mix red and white, but um, that's not for this. So anyway, this is to go with the cake. And I can tell by the um, comments here that we have some people who have already made it. There's the cake. Thank you, Sue. And Susan Dabronski, I'm so glad you like it with the rosé. It is a phenomenal pairing. It really, really is. It's a great pairing, yes. And uh, that's actually, David, you really surprised me on this one, I'm sorry to say. I knew that it would be a good pairing, but I didn't know it would be a great pairing. It's a great pairing. It's a great pairing. <laughs> and per your suggestion, we use, and here's, I don't know if you can see, this is with the oranges and the sauce on top, but we use the almond extract. You had said either vanilla or almond, and the almond is really lovely with that, definitely. It is a great, I mean, the, the, both vanilla and almond worked really, really well. Um, when I made one version, I used uh, a, an extract called Fiori di Sicilia, which you can get from King Arthur Flower. I think it's their thing. Um, and it's orange blossom and citrus blossom with vanilla. Mm. And um, that actually was an interesting, it worked with the rosé well, not as well as the almond or the vanilla, um, but it, it did not work at all. I tried everything with all of them, by the way, just so you know. Um, <laughs> if you've got a bottle of wine open, why not? And I have to say that the, the, the sparkling grenache worked well with the almond and the uh, vanilla, but the rosé really works just stunningly beautifully. And I don't, I never thought of, I, I, I was really surprised myself because cake and, and wine, I never think of that. I now will think of that all the time. Yeah, yeah, it was, a, it, it is a really great pairing. And, you know, I typically will, in a winemaker dinner, we typically have the rosé as part of the dessert. And that's always a, a stretch in some cases, depending on what that dessert is. Um, but this is beautiful. It's just a spa. It's, it's a great, it really is a great berry. Mm -hmm. So it goes with dessert, but it really is a very versatile wine. Mm -hmm. um, we considered pairing it with the mm -hmm. supplies, for example. Um, I We had it not too long ago with a Provençal French, a Provençal fish soup. That was super good. So I think that we're um, we're getting lots of good compliments. Patty Allen has said that she would like to sell your wines on the East Coast. Well, we would like that. <laughs> she represents um, several very nice uh, wineries. That would certainly help out my families and friends on the East Coast. Tell her to call me. <laughs> I think that's going to be too much. Yeah, okay. Uh, Okay, so anyway, this is Grenache uh, Noir. Just for those of you who do, because I write about uh, Provence wines, I'm just gonna mention this, that for those of you who drink uh, wines from Provence, the very light wines, those are also made um, with a, a good portion um, of, of the juice coming from Grenache Noir. Uh, it's required that there is some Grenache Noir in there to have a, a, an Appalachian wine. Um, and I uh, would like to just say something about Sue's rosé too, that uh, this rosé, in contrast to other rosés that you might find, particularly in the um, Napa, Sonoma area, these grapes were grown specifically for this rosé. And they were harvested with this rosé in mind, which I think is really why they work so, well, do you want to elaborate a little bit? Yeah, so really, it's, we call it a dedicated rosé. So it's not made by Sanye. So uh, most rosés in the area are made by Sanye method, which means that the winemaker is going to make a red wine, and he pours off some of his juice early on in the process and makes a rosé with it. Ours is made similar to our whites in that it's picked early, to keep the alcohol levels low, to keep the acid levels high. The Sanier method wines have to be, um, some magic has to be worked in the winery to get the acidity levels up because it's you're really picking for a red wine. So you're gonna have higher alcohols, less acidity. 
So the key there is like in Provence, most of the um, grapes in Provence are picked to be dedicated for rosé. So they're picked young and, or not young, but early at lower sugar bricks levels. And then um, it, it keeps the um, acid balance really nice. So it's, it's a ref I think it's more refreshing than the rosés that are made Sanier. Absolutely. It's really, again, our cheers to the winemaker. Okay. Yes. So um, that is just about a, a wrap for us, except for questions. We've got lots of questions, it looks like. So we have 13 questions. Let's see if we can, and we're well, going to check. Well, before, before we do that, though, let me just say um, that if if you have a, a lot of wine left, and these days we don't have a lot of company in, so what, if there's any number of ways to keep your wines fresh. Um, if you can, pour your wine into a smaller bottle. That's one way to have less oxygen that would affect the wine. And then, what is this called? I can't remember. Uh. It's some kind of a... It's, it's, it's it sucks the oxygen out of a vacuum van. A vacuum van. Um, these are available just about anywhere. You put the, the cork inside, and then you use this to suck the air out of it. Because what you want to do is to have the least air possible in order to keep your wine fresh. Um, okay, we, some of you may have a Coravan. I didn't use the Corvan because I actually thought that we would be yeah. drinking most of the wines today and tomorrow. But <laughs> that is something else that you can do. It just pokes a little hole in the top of the cork and in, into the cork, lets you pour out some wine and replaces it with what kind of gas? Argon. Argon. So that's another good way uh, to, um, to use it. Keep your wine in the refrigerator. There's less oxygen there. If you don't have any of those things that I've just talked about, and just put the cork back in and put it in your refrigerator. Um, or drink it all. Or drink it all, yes. <laughs> and I would encourage you to invite your friends or, over, but these are different kinds of, of days. Um, and they do last, these wines will last, you know, when you're dealing with older wines, they don't have much of a shelf life um, after they're opened, unless they're done by the Coravin process. But these wines are younger wines, the 19s. Uh, we have no problem keeping them in the refrigerator um, for three, even four days without any real change in the in the wine at all. So uh, if you can manage to have a glass a night, night um, that usually takes care of it. And then some people will freeze wine. You could put it in ice cube trays and um, pop them out into a Ziploc bag, and you can either... You can use it for a little glass for yourself, or you can use it for recipes. But it freezes very well. Yeah, uh, you know, on that subject, there are um, there are these things that you can get and keep in your your freezer. I don't know what these are called either, but they're frozen, and they allow they you can you can put them in your glass to make your wine, wine. the wine pearls colder. If suddenly you decide you would like to have a glass of white wine, choose white wine or, or the rosé, put them in, this will this will make it um, colder without adding any water. What Sue's suggesting is also a great idea because you're adding rosé back into the rosé. So um, there are all sorts of, of tricks to the trade here, if you will. Or maybe next time David can talk a little bit about what we could do as far as cooking with any leftover wine. Don't, you don't need to talk about it now, but there's something to talk about. David has a message from Krista. And Krista said, David, our 13 year old son refuses to eat mushrooms, but he's hungry. And he wandered into the kitchen during this experience and picked up a filet, filet de fouilleté and ate it before asking what was in it. And he loved it. He can't believe how good it was. We have a convert. Yay! That's Yay. Yay. <laughs> that's <the best> way. <laughs> and to, to re respond to Liz, we will, um, this, this has been recorded and we will um, have that yes. up on Sue's, Sue's website. Um, yes. so how long will it take to get it out? How long does it take? 
to get it on. It's, um, a, it's, insane. it's insane. So ridiculous. you just use yeah. the link that you use to sign in today, and you'll be able to get that. And then, then I'll also put a blog post out there uh, with the link. Okay. So um, I'm so, going to pop in for a second because actually Deborah, who's online with us today um, from New Jersey, um, her daughter doesn't eat mushrooms. And so she checked with me beforehand and had some suggest if I had any suggestions, what might be used if people don't eat mushrooms. And believe me, there's a lot of people out there who don't eat mushrooms. So I suggested doing um, some sauteed or steamed mixed vegetables with a cream sauce or a bechamel sauce with added grated cheese um, and steamed broccoli or even small, small nuggets of chicken breast with some shallot and deglaze with some of the wine or stock and then uh, add cream. So all those things will work really well. Pretty much anything you want to put in a puff pastry box, it's going to work. <laughs> Sounds good. So um, question, Sue, um, yeah. I can't read the question, so okay. clear yeah. away. Um, Rob, do you want to click on the questions? Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. first question, um, was it Susan, I think? And salted butter. Oh, Susan. Okay. Uh, unsalted, unsalted butter in the recipe. Is that what it was calling for, David? Unsalted butter? Yes. I, I, you know, I don't, can't remember what I put, but I always use unsalted butter because the salting of butter was meant to preserve it. Um, unsalted butter has a better flavor. It's a shorter um, shelf life. But if you want to add salt, add the salt as you want it, not as the butter dictates. And I find it changes the flavor of the, the creaminess of the butter. So I, I'm definitely an unsalted butter camp. Great. And then uh, Michael and Paula asked, is asking about the recipe. They said they never got it for some reason. So I sent emails out to the um, emails on file, but the recipes are also up on our website. So you just go to Acquiesce Winery and under recipes, I put all of David's three recipes that we talked about today there. And there's a little link to download them and uh, so you can print them. So it prints out a PDF file. So you, uh, it's very easy to print it out. Um, from your computer. And then let's see, my citrus sauce for the cake is not getting syrupy and it's been simmer, simmering almost an hour. What should I do? Am I doing something wrong? Um, you could add a little bit more honey or sugar or enjoy it as it is. I, I can't, since I can't see it, I, I can't exactly tell, um, but there are basically, uh, you could take the um, Supreme, the, uh, the, the segments of the fruit and use that and a little bit of the liquid and rather than um, keep simmering, uh, I think you'd be fine that way. Yes, and I also noticed because we made our uh, cake yesterday, when I refrigerated the sauce, it got much thicker. So, and it's lovely on there cold, you know, so I think that might be a way to cure that problem. And I think so much of it must depend on the oranges that you use too. Mm -hmm. That's true, the, the juiciness of the oranges. Yeah, I, I mean, um, this recipe is sort of the way grandmother used to give us recipes or mom used to give us recipes. Use three oranges and, and use this many clementines. Well, the, the size <laughs> of the fruit is very different. So right. I, I think it's um, it's just a, there's a little bit of difference there. So exact measurements and, and using a scale is probably a really good idea. And I uh, slap my hand for not doing that. And let me just add that we used blood oranges for, for our topping and it was super good. Pretty too. Huh? Yeah. yeah. So David, um, there, uh, Lisa is asking, are you using heavy cream or cream crepe fresh for the sauce? You could use either. I used heavy cream because that's what I had on hand, but crème fresh works just as well. Um, by the way, a note, if you cook your sauce too long, it will begin to separate again and you'll get your, um, the separation between the cream and the butter. So you don't want to have it sit too dry. So then um, the Kelly would like to know, why put the center back on the boxes before cooking since they don't puff the same? Why not just put the centers on the baking sheet separately? I have done exactly what they suggested and the puff pastry can, um, cave inward if it doesn't have the support of the center box part. So mm -hmm. th I, it's a very good question and that's why I did it that way. Uh -huh. um, the first time I think I did it, the sides puffed up and puffed in and I didn't want that. I wanted them to puff outward or at least straight up. Great. And then um, Peter and Sue wants, want to know, David, 
they didn't catch what to do with the leftover yolks. And I know you have great suggestions for that. Oh, there. Um, so, um, so first of all, I often think of doing this kind of dish in reverse, because as I said, I whenever time I, I use a yolk in a recipe, I save the white. Um, but if you're going to make the cake and you want to make the cake and you have, when I made the cake last time, I made it three times this time around. Um, the last time the eggs were such that the whites, I only needed 10, but I used 10 yolks to make pasta. So it was just yolks and flour and a little bit of salt. Um, you can use the yolks mixed with some egg or what, depending on the recipe to make lemon curd. Um, it's great for thickening sauces. Um, there's any we made other. creme brulee. Creme brulee. Absolutely. Rodney made or, mayonnaise. Or, uh, mayonnaise. Or oh, mayonnaise, mayonnaise. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, tartar sauce. Yeah, exactly. There's any number of ways to use um, the egg yolks. But I usually go in the other direction because usually I need an egg yolk for one thing. And then I end up with all these extra egg whites. So I usually go in reverse and make the cake after I have oh. enough egg whites. Mm, that's a good idea. Yeah. And so, the, I, let me just say also, if you have dogs, um, <laughs> dogs really like the egg yolks as well. We cook them a little bit, and they really oh. like. They don't understand you talking to the screen either. <laughs> one other thing. One other thing is you can actually preserve your egg yolks. Um, Rodney and I talked about this last time. You can pack them in salt for several days, and they will become kind of almost hard boiled from the salt for the mm -hmm. curing and you can grate them on pastas or on salads. Um, you can also, there's a recipe, I think it's from the New York times where you cure them in soy sauce and you can then make sort of a sushi based on sushi rice with topped with the egg yolk. And last time I did that, I made um, soy sauce pearls to go with them. And it was a really great uh, appetizer. I, oh, I made also soy sauce and, um, sushi vinegar uh, pearls. Mm. And let me just uh, shout out what Suzanne is saying, the hollandaise sauce. Excellent idea. Yeah, great idea. And I'm going to still answer questions, but I was remiss in talking to um, some of the people that joined us, um, David and Evan from Chicago and uh, uh, Gail and Jimmy from Chicago and my son Marshall from Portland is on the call and I just wanted to do a little shout out. But then I'm going to talk about, um, I uh, see who is, I don't know who asked, but um, they added some stem baby tomatoes to the oven to roast alongside. It really added to, really added to it. Oh, that sounds like a good pairing. Mm. Yeah. So is that with the souffle or with the feuillete? I don't know. Yeah, say, Maybe yeah. they'll have to answer that one. Was it the souffle? I, yeah, we'll have to see if they want to answer in the chat bar. So by the way, you uh, mentioned Sue using the leftover souffle the next day, and it was really good. Um, I, I know this sounds kind of crazy, but leftover souffle chilled, sliced, also makes really great little tiny um, hors d'oeuvre sandwiches. Oh. With, with a little bit of bread. It's really, really good. Wow. Oh, interesting. Great. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So Peter and uh, Peter and Sue want to know if they change the mix of herbs to change the wine pairing. Okay. How can they change the mix of herbs to change the wine pairing? And I can tell you right there, and I'm sure David has some suggestions, but uh, we tried the souffle two different ways. Um, today we tried it with rosemary instead of the mm. thyme and parsley, and it does completely change the pairing experience, but it's really lovely. Rusan, so Rusan the Roussan would also be, is a great pairing with um, the rosemary. It's what we've done little pairings in the tasting room. We always use rosemary to pair with the Roussan. And I, I would agree. You can use all sorts of different herbs. The one herb that I don't find works well in this souffle is basil. Mm -hmm. um, I've used tarragon, I've used thyme, I've used rosemary. I use a mixture and doing a mixture is perfectly wonderful. Um, and in that case, you might use a little. Um, we have some unusual herbs in our garden like myrtle and that is as a wonderful uh, earthy flavor to it as well. And then let me just chime in and say, I think that's the, the fun of this to discover what works, maybe what doesn't work. And I know we're opening a lot of wine, which is why we have the, the core event, um, just to explore what, what pairs well. 
Some things do, some things don't, and some things are extraordinary, like and, I think David did today. And yeah. by the way, that, that souffle recipe, it is not your fancy, really high puff souffle. It is not intended to be. It's what Jacques Pepin called his mother's country souffle. But the nice thing about it is you can make that and have it all ready, and you can have it sit on the counter for an hour or two while you're ha entertaining your guests and just pop it in the oven, and it's really fantastic. Mm -hmm. it, as, as both of them were saying when I was resetting up my computer, it is so easy, you almost think you've done something wrong. Um, <laughs> but it is really, really good, and it makes just for a great dinner or luncheon, it's, it's pretty perfect. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And then I'm, I'm just, is the winery open yet for tasting is one of the questions. Uh, not yet. So uh, we're working on it. We hope to be open uh, early April right now. Um, under the conditions in San Joaquin County, we're not able to open inside, which would be our preference um, since weather is very iffy right now. So um, we're really hoping after we finished with bottling in March that we'll be ready to open. Um, in April, whether it's inside or outside, we will see. And let's all get vaccinated and wear masks and keep safe, and that'll help us open sooner. Um, so could David, Susan wants to know, could David talk about the process of deciding the food to pair with a certain wine? How do you go about it? So sometimes, thank you, Susan, sometimes I go about it um, it's, it's sort of like the egg yolks and the egg whites, you know, which came first, the wine or the food. And I have to go both ways sometimes and figure out um, what I want to know about either. So um, what I write for Susan Manfold on the Provence Wine Zine once a month, um, and sometimes I will have a wine that I don't know. I have one bottle of it. I'm going to use it that day. I don't know that much about it. So I, I research it. I find out about the grapes and then I find about what is it more this or more that. And I, I and I trust the winemakers. Thank you, Sue Tipton, um, for the information they can give you on what to pair with your wine. I often find that and, and Sue and Rodney are amazing because they give you lots of options. Many wineries will say this is good with fish, but it's actually good with so many more things. But if you know your grapes and what they're going to work with, that's how I go that way in the other direction. I, I sometimes will make a, a, a food item and I'll, I'll just start thinking, what, I, I, you know, you just sort of think, what would I want to pair with that? And, um, you know, it, it's really pretty intuitive for me, but um, I'm happy to take questions if anybody has questions ever. But I have to say these two women are probably the best people to ask if you, if, and you can find them both online. Anybody who isn't a wine person is happy to help you find a pairing for the, for the food you're making. Yeah, and like I, I tell the people in the tasting room, unfortunately, we have to drink a lot of wine and eat a lot of food to come up with these pairs. So we're willing to sacrifice our extra pounds for the greater good. You are. I, I was just going <laughs> to say something similar to that. I mean, it really, it's practice. And, and I, I know that I still find it a little intimidating, um, but it's practice. Yes. So, but you know when you've experienced it. Yeah, you know, not, you know, you when know. When you it, have when a it perfect works. pairing, it's like very the, obvious. The Foyte and the Grenache Blanc still, whoa, it was amazing. And I, and the other pairings are super good too. But that one is a, is real synergy. That it, to me, it makes the food taste better. It makes the wine taste better. It's it's um, it elevates everything for sure. Right. By the way, Susan Manful, I just noticed that we're like almost um, photographic positive negatives of each other. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I told Sue that I, I had a pink dress on thinking of, of Patty Lornell, who's, who's on here, who used to wear a pink dress when she poured the, the rosés at the Provence, uh, Provence in the city. And so I was going to have a pink Guess one bit of a sleeveless and pink yeah. and he just didn't look <laughs> Okay, so I've gotten a couple of requests that Red needs to make a camera debut. Okay, Tommy. What's Can that? you lift up Red? Yes. Can you guys hear him? Red is the most wonderful dog. <laughs> I love Red. 
Red is a great dog. Red is a Glen, e Glen Eagle. Is that? Glen of a Mall Terrier. Glen of a Mall Terrier. Hey, everybody. Say hi. Hey, uh, hi. Okay, he's an Irish dog. Size of that hand. And he doesn't like it when he's not the center of attention. So now he should be happy. Yes, yes. I think there's a couple more questions. Whoa. Let's see. Um, Rodney's scrolling through. I preserve sparkling. Oh, how to conserve the preserve the sparkling wine? Do you do it like the uh, the uh, still wines? It's a little more difficult. Yeah, so, it is more difficult. But there are the yeah. stoppers that you can get, Patty Marno. Uh, this is one I'm happy I'm using right now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So do you have, do you sell those there? Hmm? Do you sell the the? Um, no, but we usually give we give them away to people that decide to open a bottle in the tasting room, so they get a, a it's a special cork for champagne uh, to keep it going. And it really we have have had it like three days in the refrigerator with this top on. It keeps the pressure inside. So that's the the problem with sparkling and saving it. You just have to make sure that you're able to keep the um, the the gas inside of it. And to do that, you need a very tight fitting uh, topper for it. So can I ask, I'm going to ask the, the, the truly plebeian, oh my God, David, I can't believe you asked me this question, question. Susan's already frightened. <laughs> um, when I was young, and I'm talking 45 years ago, I was told by putting a, 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 a stainless steel spoon in, and honestly, it has sort of worked, but I'm wondering if it's just good, good sparkling wine and it just lasted. Yeah, I, yeah. I, is there I think science I was reading about that the other day, and I don't know, maybe it's psychological. Is, I, I, I mean, is there any science to it somewhere? I, I don't know. I never asked. Yeah. Um, I let's let, let's investigate that. Mr. All Google, right. I think the simplest solution so, is to finish the bottle. Yeah, simplest solution is to finish the bottle. And I, I don't. No, that's why people, I think, you know, they use sparkling to celebrate. It's not just because it tastes so great, but you're going to have people over to share it with normally because you want to finish the whole bottle that evening. That's the ideal way to drink it. But it will last a few days in the refrigerator with the proper cork in it, cork stop. So, um, Lisa Harper is saying, I could not resist opening the Grenache Blanc before the webinar. I paired it with a Portuguese cod stew, and it was fantastic. Awesome. And Rodney wants to know, Lisa, if you'd email us the recipe. <laughs> stew at ab-wine.com. <laughs> you know she's related to us. Oh, is she? Oh, she is? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, she's a terrific cook. Uh, All right. So um, yeah. are we yeah. should we wrap up? Well, there's one that's a last cooking question. Okay. Is there an easy way to make the orange segments? <laughs> um, you know, uh, okay, so um, I don't know what you've done, but this is how I do it. I uh, slice off the top and I slice yeah. off the bottom and then put it flat on and use a very sharp knife to slice off the outsides. And then I hold it in my hand and go on one side of the segment and then flick the knife up and go out the other side of the segment. And it keeps the membrane, it, the membrane is strong enough to, to, to keep the knife from, from cutting that usually. And it just gives you kind of perfect segments. And yeah, and now uh, Rodney wants to mention that Jacques Pepin has a great video about how oh, to great. supreme an orange. Um, it's just when you see it, uh, you'll say, why didn't I think of that? And it's basically what you're telling us, David. So, yeah. So, um, so Lisa's going to send us the recipe. Great sure. for the stew. We'll have to share it online. Appreciate it, Lisa. And should we kind of wrap things up, Susan, David? I, I, I think we should. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I uh, we we went a little over, and I hope you all knew that you could have signed off gracious uh, with graciously at um, whatever time. But anyway, here we are. We thank you very much. Um, Really, thank you, Sue, for making this opportunity work for everyone with your wine. David, thank you for coming up with the, the brilliant pairings. And thank you all for coming. It makes it so much more fun when there's 
a lot of people there and you're asking questions and uh, we're so glad that, that you're that you're here. Um, and I think and our, I, our next date, don't forget Susan. We're yes. talking about um, the Sunday before Mother's Day. So mark your calendars if you'd like to join us again for a Cook, Drink and Learn 3 for Sunday, May 2nd. It would be one o'clock Pacific Standard Time, four o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And I want to thank Susan, Towney, David, Mark, and everyone that's participated today for making this super fun. Uh, we look forward to all getting together and um, sharing our wines and recipes with you and Susan with your great wine knowledge. And um, please join us again and thank you so much. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank bye you. bye everybody. Bye. Cheers. 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 <laughs> So Susan, or uh, Sue, and uh, David, um, are we, are I'm we going to, for a little bit? what's that? We're still live right now. Yeah. But, yeah. I just want to say that I, I'm almost finished. I have a couple more paragraphs in, to insert in my Grenache article. So I'll send that out to everybody too. Please. But it's really, really interesting. Um, Do you find so much more out there about the red grape than you do the white? Well, Absolutely. In fact, you, as I wrote in the article, people just drop the noir because they assume that you're talking about Grenache noir. It's really interesting. Um, about Jansen's Robinson. Oh, Jan, well, and I, you know, I, I've looked at a lot of different sources, and and so I, I, you know, read Jansen's Robinson a lot, and she had said she just sort of said, oh you know, there's that Grenache Gris and, you know, nobody pays attention to it. It's definitely a treasure and grape. And then something I found this more recent article that said, oh my God. And she was just enchanted with um, the uh, single varietal Grenache Gris. So that's what made me start looking for them. And Tommy was a good sleuth and found some that uh, we, we will go pick up tomorrow, but it is gonna to snow tomorrow, so we'll, we'll see. So there's a Grenache Gris that you might have tried when you went to the Roan Ranger tasting in San Francisco. I know Two Shepherds Winery in Sonoma. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, did you try it? You know it? Did you try yeah. it? Mm -hmm. Yes. How do you, what do you think? Um, the winemaking style is a bit different than ours. So, you know, that's the thing you just have to kind of, I think it's a lovely grape and I think it's really lovely and hopefully we'll see more of it. And I think the, the point you have to get over when you're selling in a tasting room, is this a rosé or mm. is it a, right. is how the wine should be. And I know Tablas Creek's been working with a few grapes like that too, that, um, even, fermented for red grapes, they look not much different than this color. And it's like, how do you sell that? Because people, if you can't tell them it's a rosé because it doesn't taste like a typical rosé and it's not a red and it's not a white. So there's of course the wine geeks that are going to be like, yes, I've got to try this. But um, the average person that walks in the tasting room doesn't know what to expect because they've never tried anything quite like it. So I can't re really remember the name of the one varietal I had there that fit the same kind of profile as the Grenache Gris as far as um, I would guess you would call it a red grape that looks a lot more like a rosé when it's fermented uh, like a red wine. <laughs> wow. It's, you know, Elizabeth Gabay, a master of wine, specializes in, in rosé and um, in Provence. I mean, she thinks we ought to do away with the categories. Mm. Because they're really just blurring. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's an article. Yeah. Uh, anyway, you also at the last minute mentioned the 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 thing that you sent out before about the the for people who today a ten percent discount. Oh yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm actually texting my niece about it right now. Oh <laughs> yeah. So there's a promo code. I don't know if any. It looks like thirty people might still be on. Maybe. But um, there's a promo code, and I did um, email everyone the promo code, but it's uh, drink with us, and that's for a 10% discount. We also have some discounts on rosé at the same time for a Valentine's special. So um, buy six bottles of rosé, and you get a $25 uh, discount plus free shipping. 
uh, by a case and you get a $50 discount plus free shipping. Um, and if you add this 10% to it, it's a steal. So yeah, awesome. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. By the way, we had, we had the rosé last night with um, fried calamari over an arugula salad with lemon and olive oil, and it was stunning. Oh, wow. Was good dinner. Oh, nice. Wow. Hey, wow. hey Dave, David, I have a question for you. Yeah. On the uh, angel food cake. Yes. In the recipe, you say use a bottle and turn it upside down so the top doesn't flatten. Yes. And Sue and I went back and forth and back and forth. <laughs> what does that mean? She's like, why? This? And I'm like, so the top doesn't get flat. And she said, that's well, not the just top, the, the cake, bottle. If you, if you just sit the cake out and you let it cool, it will deflate in the pan. But if you turn it upside down and have it on a bottle of wine or a bottle of whatever, um, the, the top will stay there and it will not deflate. But Sue's argument is that's not upside down, that's right side up. It depends on how you serve your cake. <laughs> but well, like our cake can though had little, has little legs on it's it. A, it's a tapered shape, it? right? Isn't but David, you are talking about putting the top on the bottom. Uh, on. That's exactly right. Yeah. So when, when, you, when you take the cake out of the oven, you've got a pan with a hole in the middle and a cake in it. Yeah, and where's the top? That's the top. You turn it upside down and you let it sit like that to cool. Yeah. So how do you serve the cake? Top or bottom? Depends on my mood. Can I quote you? But I, I remember when my mother made the food cake, we had to be really careful walking into the kitchen. No, actually, humidity is more the issue. It's not. It's not like a souffle. It's not like it's not going to fall in the oven. But if you have a really humid day, and I know you never have those in Portsmouth, um, <laughs> um, it's a bad oh, there's day to a few in the summer. Yeah, it's a bad day to make. Uh, you have them in the winter too, by the way. It's not a dry cold. Um, it's um, so you you just have to be careful because the humidity is not a friend of beaten egg whites. But like we're in Lodi, which is very dry, and we are fairly dry. It's a really easy thing to make one all the time. It was terrific. I loved it. Yeah, it's a I, great I can't wait to yeah. make it again. D David, I think when you're when you're writing your recipes, think about people over sixty and how confused we get very easily, <laughs> and then we argue back and forth. I'm over sixty, Rodney. I didn't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. All right, you guys. David, we're having a mushroom pot pie tonight that has the mushrooms that you use, the lions, what are they called, lions? Lion's mane. Lion's mane mushrooms in it. I, I mean, it's made that. entirely of lion's mane mushrooms. That's wow. wonderful. Wow. Cool. Great. So, and Liz is asking if I have any plans for a skin contact orange grenache. Yeah. Not right now. But you never know. But the idea was just born. Yeah. The orange wines. The orange wine. I wouldn't call it an orange wine. No. You wouldn't call it an orange wine? No, no, no. The one Tony's saying to just talk about the one. We just had one uh, with the, that a guy, a, a really talented winemaker, sent us from um, Provence. But I wouldn't call it an orange wine. Uh, it would be more of a yellow. Yeah, I mean, it was a, a, a wine that the, the color changed because there was a oxidative maceration. It's a super interesting wine. I'm bringing some back when we come. It, incredibly, incredibly interesting. Talk about wines that changed over time. Whoa. Yeah. Well, typically an orange wine would be where it had complete skin contact through the whole fermentation process. So that yeah. would be different than the one that you're talking about. Right. Yeah. You know, there's all these little side projects that I think would be a lot of fun, but to try to incorporate them into our daily uh, winemaking. Um, and just to kind of a heads up to um, our crop load in 2020, like all of Lodi, was down over 25 percent, more of like 30 percent. So we'll have a lot less wine 2020 wow. Wow. than we did in 2019. So. That also kind of limits the um, specialty things yeah, we can do because yeah. we can't afford to 
uh, sacrifice some of those wines. And we do really want to um, start on a couple other sparklings. I'd really like to do a pic pull blanc sparkling and also a rosé sparkling. So yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of in the plans to begin in 2021 and um, we'll see what happens depending on harvest. Excellent. Well, that's part of the fun of being a winemaker. Yes. It's very nice. Get and pick. hopefully pretty soon we can have a cook, drink, and learn all in one location. We Here. can all be together. Yes, you guys that come. That would be amazing. Wouldn't that be that good? Be cook in our kitchen. How's that? Sounds good. Sounds, good. Good. Sounds good. Miss you guys. Miss you too. All right. Take bye care. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.